politics has been a major player throughout this pandemic. And as we try to work our way out of this crisis, it continues to be a headline. With us now to talk a little bit more, Dave Dulio. He's a professor of political science and director of the Center for Civic Engagement over at Oakland University. Always great to have you with us, Professor. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Uh, before we kind of uh, take a deep dive into the world of politics, I want to say congratulations to you and your team over there um, about your latest recognition uh, for getting the students engaged in the election cycle and politics and voting. But how were you able to do this throughout the middle of a pandemic? Well, thanks. You know, we were uh, recognized as a voter-friendly campus um, recently. We've uh, uh, done some great work with great partners. We have great support uh, from our partners in the uh, uh, Oakland University Student Congress with different offices across the campus, uh, right up to the president's office. Uh, President Peskovitz is a huge supporter of, of what we do and is always offering encouragement and um, and, uh, and her backing of the things we do. And, and we're no different than anybody else in the last year. We've had to just shift, we've had to adapt. And, and I think that, um, you know, COVID stinks, right? <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that there's gonna be some things that stick with us that are gonna be positives, are gonna be benefits. I think that in the work that we do, I'm already thinking about I mean, fingers crossed when we're back to quote normal in the fall, you know, how can we deliver uh, programming? How can we do events that um, is is going to reach more people? And I think we're going to we're going to be in an era uh, for the foreseeable future where we do things in a hybrid fashion, where we we want to have people together in the same room again. No doubt about it. But I think we're gonna we're gonna do things virtually as well, uh, and combine the two to to reach people who want to come out to events on campus, but also go directly to them in their homes. What I've loved to see um, over the past year, year and a half, was really the engagement in that younger generation because they really are our future and we need them to be engaged. And uh, do you think because of COVID, but also the George Floyd trial and his death has helped ignite some of that passion for them to get involved? Oh, I think that those are, are two uh, factors. I think there are others. Uh, I, I On both sides, and because this is not just a one-sided thing. Uh, uh, Donald Trump's uh, candidacy for president, uh, his campaign, his uh, term, and his second campaign uh, also really brought young people into the conversation. Uh, and and I'll uh, certainly most young people voted for Joe Biden and before him Hillary Clinton. However, uh, I'll take you back to 2016 when when I was what was the one of the first. So, attention getters for me on campus to look ahead to, to Trump's victory uh, were a number of students. I was shocked at the number of students who I talked to who said something alike. Um, I, I voted for Bernie Sanders in the primary, but I'm voting for Trump. Wow. Right. And it was, it was that, that was the exact reaction that I had. Right. And so it was uh, it was all the way back to there where I think we can look at at maybe one of the first flashpoints to get uh, young people involved. I really think politics right now is fascinating and even more so than ever because uh, because everything that is attached to our lawmakers. And for the first time, I think some of the people are really trying to, they're starting to see the impact that our elected leaders have on our day-to-day -day of lives. And, uh, but with that, there's so much bipolar, not bipolar, but polarization. Some would say bipolar. Uh, Whitmer, I think, is going through a bipolar situation. But um, with that, though, it, we're so divided right now. And we've talked about that numerous times with you as well. But uh, I love what you guys are doing coming up here for the uh, at the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University and in the panel discussion to talk about um, basically trying to come together. And how do we do this? A path to civility. Is it even possible? I think it is. 
I, I think that there is uh, demand out there for not only uh, the, the kind of conversation we're going to have tomorrow morning, but for that approach. And, you know, we, we've had a tremendous response to uh, over the last couple of weeks where we've publicized this opportunity for folks to come and hear from uh, three members of Congress, uh, two of the most well-respected journalists in our state, uh, for this for this conversation about uh, defying the divide and, and finding a path to civility. Uh, I, I think there really is an appetite out there in the public for the conversation that's going to happen, but also the approach to lawmaking and approach to problem solving that that it is possible. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well, there is hope for tomorrow. Um, and we are, it is springtime. And with spring is eternal hope. And with that, uh, so I do find it um, pretty interesting. The members that are going to be a part of this panel, Slotkin, Dingo, and Upton, and they're members of the House of Representative Problem Solvers Caucus. First, I'm like, is it, it's kind of sad that we even need to have such a group uh, right it, 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 isn't that what they're all there to do is right. solve problems right I, I, that's a, that's a great although I, I i did think like did they did they steal the pri uh, problem solvers uh you know uh like branding from fox 2 <laughs> no because fox 2 actually solves problems but sorry, sorry. <laughs> did they copyright that right i mean they got this right right to, uh file the right paperwork uh yes all three of these members are uh are part of the Problem Solvers Caucus. And, and that was our decision rule on who to invite to this. Mm -hmm. uh, Michigan, I, I think, is fortunate to have five members of the Problem Solvers Caucus, which, if for your viewers and li listeners who don't know, is a, is a group of bipartisan members of the House. And in order to become a member of this caucus, you have to bring somebody from the other side of the aisle with you. So they come in in pairs. One Republican and one Democrat are, uh, a, a, are permitted membership, if you will, at a time into this caucus. Uh, and they focus on, and you can go look them up on the, on the web, but focus on finding ways to solve problems in a bipartisan, or, a bipartisan manner, finding common ground, um, and putting together proposals in, a, in this bipartisan way. Uh, Michigan, as I said, has five of these members, the three you mentioned, plus uh, Representative Stevens and Representative Meyer uh, from the west side of the state. And, and we're thrilled that we could get three members' uh, schedules to line up. Uh, we, we wanted all five, and the scheduling, as you know, is incredibly difficult yeah. with members of Congress. We're, we're delighted to have three. Um, and to talk about the Problem Solvers Caucus, their approach to uh, coming at questions coming at problems in a bipartisan manner, looking for ways that uh, common ground can be found. Um, and we're also delighted to have, uh, as I said, two of the most well-respected journalists in the Metro Detroit area, probably in our state, uh, Nolan Finley from the Detroit News, Stephen Henderson from the Detroit Public Radio, to serve as moderators. And we asked them uh, to do this because they have started a project, it's called the Civility Project, about uh, the, many of the same issues, mm -hmm. right? Where, uh, and, and they'll talk about this tomorrow, I'm sure. Nolan and Steven disagree about just about anything you can find politically. But they have a wonderful relationship, right? They have a, they, they maintain a friendship, they maintain a relationship. And, and that's also important for as, as we move into uh, a governing time, you know, between campaign cycles, uh, folks need to, to have that, to, to be able to, to understand that they can disagree with somebody. And if they do, that's okay. The other person isn't the devil. They're not evil just because they have a different opinion. Dave Dulio with us here on the Mega Cast. He's a professor of political science and the director for the Center for Civic Engagement over at Oakland University. And I'm hoping a lot of this work is actually going on behind the scenes. We just don't hear about it because we know the pressure of the political parties as well. Um, but with that, if we can kind of dip into a couple other conversations. Um, sure. It, it, there are so many things going on right now. I will say Whitmer. 
I, I do. I, we When I said bipolar, I'm like, what's happening right now with her? Um, I'm a cynic, but all of a sudden, no restrictions and our case numbers of COVID-19 are through the roof. We're leading the nation. Before, she would have been shutting down the state, but now she's saying no. It's just a personal responsibility issue. Yeah, I, I think that it's a totally fair question to ask. And, and I, you know, one of the things I think would solve a lot of the issues uh, that we're talking about is simple transparency, right? Yep. And and early on, Governor Whitmer was out daily talking about case numbers and, and th steps that the administration was taking. Um, and maybe she's doing just a little bit less of that, but it's not nearly as covered or as available no as she's doing less she's doing less okay so she's doing less yeah. I, I, I think that that the public uh just wants to know the rationale and if if a if a different course has been chosen just tell us about it right tell us why things seem to be operating differently in under these circumstances than they were 12 months ago you, you know we've heard the terms we're following the science and the data over and over and over again. But uh, give us that science and data now behind your decision making. Otherwise, um, hopefully there is a very bored journalist out there who might start <laughs> digging into the money. Because I always say, follow the money. Yeah, uh, right, you know, right. the governor of uh, Florida is getting hit with that right now. Follow the money. There's always money behind it when it comes to politics. And talking about money, Biden is out right now. President Biden, Biden is out pushing his $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan. They're throwing around these T's and the B's like it's water. And I'm like, who's paying for this? And is this a right time to talk about infrastructure? Totally agree our infrastructure here in the United States oh, yeah. needs addressing. I have been covering uh, you know, the state of some of our bridges uh, in Ohio and Michigan for years, and you couldn't even get a blip on the radar. All of a sudden now, we need to fix it. Where's this money going to be coming from? Well, I, I, it comes from uh, several places. Uh, first of all, if, if the plan that the Biden administration has uh, started to roll out uh, is followed, uh, you'll see a big tax increase uh, on businesses, corporations, and uh, folks with, with high incomes. Um, so that would offset some of the cost. But look, the, the, the federal government uh, spends uh, trillions dollars trillions of dollars more than they take in every year yeah right so we have to borrow it too so we have creditors uh that are both domestic and foreign uh but we borrow a bunch of money the the federal government's good at a, a number of things borrowing money is is one of them and uh you know our our federal debt is approaching 30 trillion dollars which is just a, a staggering number, um, you know, and, and I think that it, it's, it's important to note that the federal government has that power. They can borrow money, uh, they can run a deficit. The state government doesn't have that option, right? The state of Michigan has to have a balanced budget uh, every year. And much more, I would argue, much more difficult choices have to be made at the state level than at the federal level. There's there's much more wiggle room at the federal level when when the the Congress can say, well, let's just borrow some more money, right? Uh, and, and I so that's that's usually how it happens. Is <laughs> right. And a proposal comes along. Uh, okay, we uh, we need to borrow some more money. So can I ask you, um, as a professor? <laughs> What are your thoughts about the timing of this? Because we just did this big trillion dollar deal to try to address COVID. We're not out of a pandemic. What about the timing of all of this? Well, I think that there's a couple of things going on or, or we could talk about a couple factors there, right? First, uh, you, you will have uh, some folks who argue against uh, raising taxes. Uh, some folks argue against raising taxes anytime yeah. uh, others will say now is not the time when businesses are struggling uh when uh the economy is uh fragile maybe at best why don't do it don't raise taxes in a time of crisis um so that's a timing issue i think the other one is 
that the, the Biden administration knows, it, frankly, it's got a short window to get some early wins, to get some early successes. And the, and the COVID relief package was one of them. Although, you know, we could talk about the way in which it, it happened uh, as certainly a, an important factor there, but they're, they're looking to, to get some of these big priorities done early in the term so they can hopefully, for their sake, build on them into the future. It, I just find the uh, timing so interesting. And while we're talking about uh, some of the things going on, we, of course, have to mention um, the GOP and some of the uh, changes to the law, in the voting laws within the uh, state of Georgia, the MLB just pulled out. And I worry, too, about, you know, um, some of the businesses that are going to be taking a hit in the state of Georgia because of the changes in the laws, the voting laws. Um, and some of these laws are being proposed here in the state of Michigan as well. Yeah, there, there's this big battle between, uh, and, and in, in many ways, it's a rhetorical battle. It's a messaging battle uh, between uh, the, the folks that talk about uh, voting rights and election security, right? And, and those, are, those are often seen as diametrically opposed and you can't have one uh, if you have the other and and I, I for one I don't think that that's the case you know we can have uh, accessible elections that are also secure uh, and and that build confidence right because the, one of the things that has come out of this 2020 cycle is a lack of confidence uh, in uh, among pretty big sections of the public in election administration election results etc cetera, etc cetera. So we know, um, obviously, this goes back to some people are comparing it to worse than the Jim Crow laws uh, in the South back in the day. But I have to say, too, uh, one of the issues at play is having to have a photo ID. And I really am I'm trying to say, what really is the sticking point on that one? Because to, in today's world, we have to have a photo ID for everything. You have to, in some restaurants, you have to have a photo ID. Um, if you don't give a photo ID, they're not going to let you come in. And so we're talking about something as basic as going in to eat dinner or, you know, you pretty much. So is more the communication should be we should be providing some type of state ID to people that are having troubles getting them? Well, so this is this is one of the key points, right, about the or key um, uh, flash points about this uh, about this new law in Georgia. Uh, but it's also not terribly new. Uh, as you know, we have uh, a, a voter ID law here in Michigan, uh, and there are voter ID laws uh, across the country in many, many states. Uh, one of the things that, that opponents to those point to is that it harkens back to the days of poll taxes, yeah. where in the South, uh, up through the 60s, if you wanted to vote, you had to pay a poll tax. You had to pay to vote, right? Which is, and, and that was intentionally targeted at minority populations, specifically African-Americans. So the idea that you have to have an ID, which costs money, is for some akin to a poll tax. Uh, you know, but again, if we're gonna if we're gonna do what we talked about before, follow the science, right? The the uh, uh, social science research that has been done on this topic uh, doesn't indicate that voter ID laws affect any part of the population more than another. And there, and I say that it, from a thirty thousand foot view of this research, there are some studies that will say yes, it does affect certain segments of the population and others that say, uh, other studies that say, no, it doesn't, right? So it's this mixed bag of research um, that has no real uh, uh, firm conclusion uh, about it. So that's what the research tells us, that there isn't a, a, an effect. Um, now you could find data that, that will tell you what you want to hear, but if we look at it from a, a sort of this meta uh, perspective, it does, it's not out there. Uh, so I think that, that that's a, another thing to, that's important to remember. Dave Dulio, professor of political science and the director for the Center for Civic Engagement over at Oakland University. Uh, professor, before we say goodbye, tell us again how we can uh, sign up for tomorrow's panel discussion. Can the general, it's open to the general public, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, everything we do at the center is for campus and community. 
that's what we want to uh, that that's how we see ourselves and, and if folks are interested in tomorrow's discussion again 10 30 to 11 30 tomorrow morning three members of Congress uh, two uh, predominant journalists in uh, Michigan they can just go to oakland.edu and all the information is there on the uh, OU homepage uh, they'll be able to through a couple clicks uh, sign up and uh, get access to the Zoom webinar tomorrow. So with that too, um, because we'll be on the show, so we won't be able to watch, can, it's going to be recorded so people can uh, Absolutely. view it later? Yep, for sure. Okay, great. You guys are doing great work over there. Thank you for all of your work. Dave Dulio, Professor of Political Science, Director of the Center for Civic Engagement at Oakland University. Always great having you, and we appreciate your expertise and your insight, as always. Well, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you.